Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second week of the Future of Business course. We're so excited that you're able to join us today. And I hope you're now in the swing of things. And of course, I've seen that many of you are already making an extra special effort to connect with each other on the course platform, which is really good. Remember that a large component of this course is the peer engagement. And we have people enrolled from companies in various industries. So it's a unique opportunity for networking, partnership and learning. And we really want you to take advantage of that as you envision new possibilities for your company and for you as a change maker. So while you might just see my face right now from the Ashoka side of things, you can rest assured that there's a very hardworking team behind the scenes that is always available to help you on the platform. Specifically, my colleagues Mark Carr and Jen Hartzell are ready to help you and to support you on this journey. And they can also assist with any technical issues you may have either during this webinar or later on. And of course, if you have questions for our guest speaker today, you can put those in the comment section right under this live webinar screen, and we'll try and have as many of them answered as we can, time allowing, of course. Right, now today we have the first of three live webinars, which are an integral part of this learning journey. And we're streaming live via YouTube, so there'll be a slight delay or time lag between YouTube and the Novo Ed platform. So just be aware of that as we interact today. And while we give it a few more minutes to allow everyone time to connect and to join us, I want to let you know that you can earn extra points for watching this webinar live. And this applies to every other webinar on this course. So while it's on, you will see a survey question at the bottom of the page asking if you're watching it live. So go ahead and click yes. If you don't see the survey during the session, just try and refresh your page and I'm sure it will come up. So this week, we are diving into module two, which is social entrepreneurship and the corporate world. And here to set the stage and to walk us through this topic today, we have Heiko Spitzek. He's a professor at Fundação Dom Cabral in Brazil, and he heads the Sustainability Management Research Center there. His teaching experience includes courses on social entrepreneurship, as well as sustainable business for MSc, MBA, and executive MBA students. Heiko has worked with senior executives, directors, and board members, aligning sustainability and strategy at several of the world's biggest companies. His teaching is informed by more than 10 years of consulting experience, as well as academic research, and his publications have appeared in numerous international journals. He's also a catalyst for the region in Brazil for the, globe, for, for the Global League of Entrepreneurs. So I could go on and on, but Heiko, it's a very warm welcome to you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Great. Would you like to start us off by just sharing with us your own professional journey and your path to becoming a social entrepreneur and intrapreneur, as well as your work with the League of Entrepreneurs? Well, I think it all started with my PhD program, where I was exploring the question like, um, what, if anything, do corporations learn from NGO critique? Um, looking at the interactions of Nestle and the infant formula um, conflict they had, and on Citigroup and other banks regarding their project finance practices. And what I understood in my research was, um, it's essential to have somebody in the organization who was able to translate NGO talk into mm -hmm. corporate talk and vice versa. Um, I, was, I remember like one of the guys we worked with uh, at Entrepreneurship came from Google and he said like, I, I need a Google translator, business, now we say ESG and ESG back to business. Um, and my research at that point was focused on, on conflict-based um, interactions between NGOs and corporations. And then uh, in 2007, 2008, I discovered a publication by Sustainability, who was um, the corporate inter social entrepreneur, a guide for corporate change makers. And from that moment, I thought like, wow, you know, this is a really interesting, interesting um, area where people have that transla translation skills in companies, but they're moving the company forward instead of just like solving conflicts they have with NGOs. Um, so I finished my, I finished, I'm German, I finished my PhD in Switzerland. 
I moved to the UK and now finally I'm in Brazil, um, heading the Sustainability Research Center. And we founded a center for impact entrepreneurship in 2018. And since then, I'm more and more working with corporates on how to get a culture and structures that support these type of people, because I believe they can really drive change and be of benefit to business at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a very interesting background. Are we, we're definitely speaking to the right person today. So just to help us to lay the foundation of our topic, can you tell us what is the difference um, between social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship? What does social entrepreneurship mean to you? Well, I think we always speak, and I think the, the, the topic of social entrepreneurship is very well established. I think Yunus has become you know, the reference globally for that. Um, earning the Peace Nobel Prize in 2006 helped pretty much in that regard. Uh, and I think like social entrepreneurship is on the agenda of, of a lot of business schools are all around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, now, entrepreneurship for me is the Yunus insight, you know, and you probably know that, you know, even companies like Goldman Sachs and the others had um, microcredit departments, so the idea spread. Um, what I find particularly interesting um, in the comparison between social entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship, um, maybe to illustrate that at an example, like relating to Yunus. Yunus founded the Grameen Bank in the end of the 60s, uh, 70s. And um, in 2006, he got the Peace Nobel Prize. So 30 years of activity, when he got the Peace Nobel Prize with Grameen Bank, uh, Grameen Bank had roughly about 7.5 million customers, of which 2 million um, he helped or they helped to get out of poverty. Now compare that to M-Pesa. Um, maybe some of you know M-Pesa, two um, um, collaborators at Vodafone in Kenya realized that um, um, only 20% of the population had access to financial services, but they knew that about 60% of the population had a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. So they asked the typical entrepreneur question, what if? What if we could implement a payment system that allows people to transfer, transfer money like sending text messages? Um, for those who know the case, you know, M-Pesa has become a reference. It's the biggest mobile payment platform in Africa right now. Uh, in Kenya alone, they reach more than 50% of the population. I can imagine that the banks were pretty much getting angry because a telco company was moving into the space of finance and that very successfully. Um, so that case is pretty much a success case, which shows the power of entrepreneurs, of impact entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs, and um, generates a lot of business for the company, which makes it attractive to scale, mm -hmm. and at the same time provides financial inclusion to millions of people who hadn't had access to these services before. Now, if we compare Yunus, you know, Yunus, 30 years, 7.5 million, uh, customers, and I can't remember now the, the transactions they had per year. If we compare that to M-Pesa, M-Pesa after five years had 17 million customers, mm -hmm. had I don't know how many times the, the, the turnover and financial transactions that the Grameen Bank had. So I wonder when Susie Loney and Nick Hughes, who got this project off the ground, will get their Peace Nobel Prize. So mm -hmm. let me connect that with the challenge as well to you guys. Like, I want to see your face. Like, if you're participating in this course, I want to see your face on the cover of Forbes magazine because you made billions of dollars for your company. And for the same project and at the same time, you get the Peace Nobel Prize. So that's mm -hmm. a little bit what I'm waiting to happen. Counting on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I like the example you brought with, with M-Pesa. I think it's a very well-known one. And you mentioned that uh, the, the banks must have been getting angry. And it ties into uh, something that we read this week in one of the articles uh, from an, an excerpt from a book called Social Entrepreneurism and All That Jazz, which I believe you co-authored with Professor yes. David Grayson. Yes. 
So there were several definitions of a social entrepreneur there. And one that struck me particularly is a social entrepreneur is two thirds change maker, one, one third troublemaker. So can you just share with us, with us some of your thinking behind that? You know, like the quote comes originally, um, or it's been inspired by Gib Bullock. Um, Gib um, was working at Accenture and he founded Accenture Development Partnerships, which mm -hmm. is an amazing institution which basically leverages the impact of big NGOs by providing quality consulting IT services to these organizations so then they become um, better at what they're doing. Um, um, but I think this realization, and if you want to drill down in that story, uh, Gib wrote an amazing book, which is called the, the Entrepreneur Confessions of a Corporate Change Agent, where he says like, and he plays in the book with that, um, he, he ended up with a burnout and um, ended up for a week in a psychological ward in Scotland because he snapped um and i think like for most entrepreneurs there's a there's at some point the hard realization that you cannot fit in and drive change at the same time so once mm -hmm. you know like and i like the portuguese language in that regard because organizations are, are organized entities with a specific goal in mind mm -hmm. and employees are called functionaries in Portuguese so you need to function in an organization mm -hmm. the moment you are entrepreneur you step a little out of this and you become non-functioning anymore <laughs> because you're dedicating some time which was not in your job description to a project which you're passionate about and which ideally fits into the strategic priorities of the organization. Um, the moment you do this, the, the corporate immune system, the organizational immune system will try to attack you. And this is normal. You know, like once you are, no, you know, this is normal and most entrepreneurs at their first stage around, they don't know this is normal. So they get, scared to say like but i'm with you guys you know but it's normal that because you're not functioning anymore as you're supposed to and um i remember as well like um, one of the entrepreneurs at bmw who was working at the first electric car he said the moment we presented the project 80 percent of bmw were against us mm -hmm. because they had made their careers, they had gained their positions, they have convinced clients based on combustion engines mm -hmm. and they were not up for losing that. So it's normal that you get attacked. Um, and one of the other entrepreneurs in Brazil, Humberto, who works at a, an insurance company, when he embarked on his project, he told his boss, you know, if this person and this person and this person are starting to work against me and are starting to complain about what I'm doing, this will be the sign that you know I'm doing my job. Right. So um, I think that's, that's the big difference here and, you know, explains the troublemaker because you're mixing up things um, and this is obviously not fun for everybody in the organization. Yeah, yeah. I, I can imagine how difficult it, it might be then for some people to resolve that tension, even within themselves, to say they are there to do a certain job. But at the same time that they see that there is a need, there, there is greater impact that, that the organization could be having. So how on a personal level can you resolve that kind of internal conflict? And we will, of course, then talk about from the corporate um, perspective as well. Um, but just as, as an individual, as, as, a, and as a budding entrepreneur, how, how do you make peace with, with the troublemaking side? I think you don't make peace with it. You learn, learn how to use it. You know, mm -hmm. um, um, I guess every entrepreneur will tell you that this is a self-discovery journey as well. And that you need to make sure that you reframe your arguments and that you're... Um, 
not creating enemies within the organization, but I think you also need to be firm on what your passion is about. Right. So don't lose trust in your project. Um, um, and I think like what GIP now is all about, for example, is to work on your personal resilience and to, to always make sure, am I improving my arguments? Does this make sense to the organization? How do I become better with this? And at a certain stage as well, um, knowing that resistance will be natural, how are you going to deal with this? And you know, I like maybe a very personal example from Valeria, Valeria Militelli, she was working at, at a couple of companies and she tried to um, enhance the sustainability strategy of the organization. And she ordered a benchmarking study. She was operating in Brazil. She was paid um, internationally and um, she ordered the study. The study didn't arrive, didn't arrive, didn't arrive, didn't arrive. And the study was done in the US. Until one day she picked up the phone and called the supplier in the US. It's like, where the heck is that study? I need that. Upon which they responded like, we sent this half a year ago to your colleagues. And that moment she realized she was sabotaged by her colleagues in her own company. And of course, at the beginning, she was getting very angry with that. But then she realized like, you know, this is a natural way some organizations deal with it. Some people deal with it. And then she said like, okay, there will always be a part of our organization which acts like that. And then she thought about how do I identify these people? How do I test these people? And then how do I deal with them? Mm -hmm. um, which helped her to distance herself emotionally from the fact that this is happening and got her on a more pragmatic level to say like, okay, this will always be the case. So what are my strategies to deal with these people? Right. I think it's so important to have that level of, of, of self-awareness when, when you embark on a journey like this. And it's great that you've already started pointing out some of the strategies that someone can adopt. My next question was actually going to be in, uh, in your experience, what kind of obstacles and challenges and resistance should social entrepreneurs anticipate when they're attempting to innovate from, from within their organization? Well, I think like the, the first thing is like there will be some resistance. Some people will not be happy with this. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think this is one thing. Um, what I also realized that the organization and many times the leadership team did not yet understand how ESG can drive value and sustainability. Like I, I prefer the term sustainability because ESG comes from the financial market and with basically a risk perspective attached okay. to it. So ESG is normally not very much innovation driven. It's more like, okay, how do we maintain what we're doing, um, doing a little less bad and thus reducing our environmental and social risks. Um, so if leadership team, the leadership team doesn't know how sustainability can drive business results, they usually see it as a cost. When they see it as a cost, they're not happy to invest in it and support initiatives. So I think like, you know, and there's the antidote immediately to it. Like, so the first thing, like, you know, there will be people against you, get powerful people on your side. You know, this is what we at the league always talk about how to navigate the political system of your organization. And, you know, over and over and over in all cases we have seen of successful entrepreneurs, they had a top management sponsor. You know, mm -hmm. you're lighting fire somewhere, you're testing something, it's not working out, you're burning money, whatever. They need to be there and say like, you know, let this person do. And I think this is a particular relevant for people who have recently joined the new organization. If you're there for a short period of time, prove yourself to the organization first so people can have reason to trust you that you're not going to screw up when you come up with a bigger project. So I think that that's an important one. 
And the second one is like, you need a business case. You need, you need some kind of a rationale and it doesn't need always be tangible value. It can be intangibles as well. But the better you have a tangible value saying like, you know, my project helps us to make more money, to justify higher prices, to reduce costs, to get additional funding, to, you know, be qualified as an ESG investment and have cheaper cost of capital or whatever. Um, do it, you know, like you need a business case because then the people have the feeling that you're not getting the stamp on your forehead that this is a tree hugger you know you're speaking business and you're contributing to what the organization is all about right so it's not enough to just have a nice warm fuzzy idea that you know is all about butterflies and you know all those beautiful things but it really has to make business sense and it has to speak to the bottom line of, of the organization as well yeah, and what about um, what about skills regarding uh, you know once you have an idea how do you communicate that to to those um, whether in authority or your your peers how do you paint that vision um, for for everyone else? Well, I think that's the big art of storytelling, you know. Um, and um, I can recommend you to watch the TED talk done by Miriam Sibiji. Um, she was global social mission director at Unilever. Mm -hmm. um, and we use her example as the perfect pitch. Um, and she goes, basically, her passion is about soap and hand washing. Um, she helped to establish um, 15th of October is Global Hand Washing Day. Because if we wash more hands, more kids will get to their fifth birthday, especially in developing nations. Mm -hmm. And her pitch is basically saying like, if we do this and get people in general to wash more hands, we save more lives and we sell more soap at the mm -hmm. same time. And then she brings in quantitative studies, then she brings in um, dedicated examples, um, so, um, I always recommend you guys like, you know, to do the first steps in storytelling. I always recommend the Pixar, the Pixar storytelling framework, which always goes like once upon a time, every day until one day, mm -hmm. because of that, because of that until finally. So, um, you know, making up a story like this for the soap um, selling of Miriam CBG at Unilever, you might come up with a story and say, like, once upon a time, there was a dollar in Africa and Somalia uh, working um, with pleasure, helping um, families to assist to get their family bigger and welcoming the babies and assisting the mothers in giving birth. Uh, to the babies. Um, every day she visited the community and um, was welcomed and was a well-respected member. Until one day, a baby boy died after she attended the family and another girl died a week after from a family she, she attended before. And people were saying and rumors were spraying that she's doomed and every baby she would touch would die, would be doomed to die. Because of that, she lost her status in the community. Not only that, she also lost um, all her income and her purpose in life because she loved to be a dola. Because of that, she was ever more excluded and getting depressed, not knowing what to, what to do and how to reestablish herself in her profession. Until one day Unilever came about, around organized a hand-washing um, education exercise in the local community school. And one of her old friends took her there. Um, she became passionate about hand-washing and the community finally understood that it was not her fault, that it was the lack of hand-washing that was prevalent in the community. So the babies were dying. Until finally she was reestablished, she became a protagonist of hand-washing and hygiene. 
as well as one of the most respected dollars again in her community. So think about the project where you can use that storytelling narrative, um, which gets people emotionally engaged and then link it to business results because you can say, and the more we have these dollars and the more we do this in these communities, the more they will buy soap and depending on market conditions, they will buy it from us. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's a great point you made about uh, telling the story from, from an emotional point of view as well, because as much as we're human beings and we think we make rational decisions, from my own research, a lot of decisions are actually made uh, from an emotional level. So I think it's good to combine those two. You, you make the business case and make it as logical as possible, but also bring out the human element as well, right? Yeah. No, I think like, you know, and, and maybe drilling down to the business case, um, of course, the business case is important, but the story you tell and the emotions you connect is much yeah. more important. Um, and there's one of the most assisted TED Talks, maybe, I guess, like most of you have seen it already. It's from Simon Sinek, How Great Leaders Inspire Action, and his book attached to that is Start With Why. If you tell a story like that, um, I just made up for hand washing. You know, this gives people a why. Why are we doing this? We are helping these women being dollars, being ever more professional, um, saving children's lives and making communities stronger and healthier. Um, who would not work for that goal? And, and how different is that from somebody saying like, you know, I'm selling soap. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. And I, I think it's a, it's a very practical tool that, that many of us can actually practice as, as we go. Um, I wanted to just bring through some questions that we've had from our learners. Uh, the first one, I think, the first one, it's um, it brings up an issue that I think uh, most entrepreneurs suffer from, which is that the element of just kind of feeling lonely sometimes or a little bit isolated. Um, so there's a question from Iva in Sweden that says, how can individuals and companies find, hire, and retain entrepreneurs in, in, in a company? So I think it relates to bringing them in and keeping them, but also maybe you can speak to the element of community and how, how important that is to, to your growth as a social entrepreneur. I think, you know, there are two angles to this. Um, first, um, and I guess you're from Ikea because we have a lot of people from Ikea here. Um, make connections internally. There are others passionate about what you're passionate about. You know? And with Aza as head of sustainability, she's an entrepreneur herself. Uh, and she definitely fosters this kind of thinking and work uh, within Ikea. Um, and there are external organizations like the League of Entrepreneurs, um, like the Aspen Institute's First Mover Program, like, and I hope this will be a, a, a revival for the unusual pioneers we did with the Medjugorje Social Business, the World Economic Forum and the Schwab Foundation, Porticus, um, the Corporate Changemaker Challenge um, we launched as well with the Schwab Foundation, World Economic Forum and and um, SIP. Space Force, I think it was. Um, I think there you find communities um, which share the same values. And, you know, I think the League of Entrepreneurs in that space is the most intimate one um, with the most high profile. Like Miriam from, from Unilever is a fellow of the League of Entrepreneurs, for example. Um, so I can really recommend you to reach out to these networks. Um, but taking it on the other side, like if you ask me on the organizational um, side, and here I'll allow myself to pull up a slide, because this is actually what I'm working on. I'm currently on a research exchange here in Europe from Brazil. So I'm currently based in Germany um, and being visiting fellow at, at the King's College in London. So how do companies do this? And, you know, um, we always 
differentiate between entrepreneurs who are developing new products, services, market solutions, new processes, new business models. So the first part is that kind of thing. Okay, how do we get this? So the employees are there. They have their competences. They have their motivation. You know, um, you can challenge them to develop a project. And Danone, for example, they have a they have a, a corporate investment fund. They say like, if you have an idea which is good for our ESG strategy and brings benefits to business. We have a hundred million euro investment fund and man, do we have money to invest in your idea? So you can challenge your employees to do this. If you do this, they come up with projects. Then you can see like how much projects am I getting? What are the business impact? Is that cost reduction? Is that new business development? What is it? And how does it advance our SDG, SDG impact or ESG impact? If you have a lot of projects, they might drive client value and help your clients to resolve their ESG challenges. Again, you can measure that in different ways and these are the measurements we use. But if you do this well, your net promoter score should go up and your sales should go up. And all this then helps you to become a company which differentiate on the market because you have a higher proportion of sustainability in your product portfolio. You have better sales, you have cost reductions, and your reputation goes up. Employer branding, la di la di la la. So this is this is why we recommend companies to instill do once a year, do it frequently because all the people who get not past the pro, the, the the first stage, you can say. We like your idea, but they're not mature enough. Come back next year. You know, mm -hmm. you don't leave them alone. But all this depends, and this is the interesting thing, on investment structures and culture. And this is the model we're working right now at our Center for Entrepreneurship, comparing a lot of companies. Um, we have, in Brazil, we have leveraged 420 companies' responses on that. So we are able to do a benchmarking study to say like, okay, how much do people invest in ESG and innovation? Do you have a structured process for advancing on entrepreneurial ideas? Do you have ESG um, indicators linked to bonus, uh, internal investment funds, coaching, la di la di la di la. And on the other side, on the culture side, like how's your senior leadership viewing these issues how is your organization's visions and values regarding this do entrepreneurs get visibility and recognition and how do leaders deal with risk and errors um because that also like if you get fired if you do an error maybe this is not an environment which is very welcoming for entrepreneurs let's say so this is the work we are currently doing and um i would love to include more companies um to see how they are doing in creating that culture because, and I think like that's, that's the challenge where the entrepreneurship impact entrepreneurship movement is right now to say like, we have all these cool projects like Empeza and others and Unilever and, you know, Life Boy Soap, et cetera, et cetera. But until now it's all isolated projects. I have not seen a company who really embraced this and say like, you know, and our mission is by doing this, we're going to reformulate the whole product offerings we have and transform us into a sustainability leader. So the question is like, if we want to move beyond some cool projects, we need to work on culture. Mm. Yeah, I think you, you, you've offered a lot of very practical um, and, and achievable strategies that companies can use to begin to change that mindset within the organization. And I'm, I'm curious, there's another element of, of Iva's question on um, recruitment. Is there a way to be able to hire people uh, as entrepreneurs or specific, specifically looking for intra, entrepreneurial sort of um, skills, affinities and so on? What what I can companies do that, to look for them? I think you know this is a very uh, very important question, um, especially if you work in HR. You know, mm. um, if I would look for headhunting for entrepreneurs, I would look at the graduates for the Aspen Institute, the graduates from the Unusual Pioneers program, and all these people, and say like, okay, these guys 
they know what they do. And the fellows of the League of Entrepreneurs, for example, these guys, they know what to do. I'll hire just a profi, you know, somebody who's really like professional on that already. Um, maybe on the other side, there's the other approach to say like, okay, how do we need to uh, modify interview protocols and the challenges we give people um, in our normal hiring process? You know, I remember um, a paper and pulp producer in Brazil who had always problems with illegal settlements and local community protests. They would ask in the in the hiring process, like, okay, you're the head of a plant in that region. Um, suddenly, the um, 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 without Earth movement, movement of Saint Terra moves into your like facility. You can't produce anymore. What do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, and if their executive responds like, "I'll call the cops and we'll shoot them out," you know, that's a thank you very much. The 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 conversation is over. Kind of question, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so you can you can check a little bit. Okay, what's the imagination of these people? But this is again very much risk oriented. I would I would challenge them like you know like how can you use our business in order to fight climate change you know or what's the cause you would like to bring in or what are the projects you realized before or did you have some training in innovation and sustainability you know like these are these are things um, what are you most concerned about um, I think that's that things you can bring into the hiring process. And by that, making sure that you, you get more entrepreneurs. But again, nobody wants a company which is 100% so like only entrepreneurs. Somebody needs to do the day to day job, you know? So um, be, be cautious not to go too far. You know? Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, we have a few more questions. Um... Some of our learners, Alinda, Renata, and Bjorn, are asking, what would you highlight as some of the best practices for measuring social impact? And what metrics might you suggest for companies? There I find, an, um, you know, it, the answer is depends. <laughs> you know? And then the question is like, depends on what, Heiko? Okay, so I'll pull up another slide here, which is related to the business case. Um, <laughs> And just go back here. This is based on a research done by BCG and MIT Sloan Management Review way back in time to say like, okay, how does sustainability um, drive financial value? And, you know, you can justify higher prices. You know, there are, you know, uh, organic brands where you pay triple the price if you go for organic um, juice, you know, they're way much expensive than the ordinary juice, et cetera, et cetera. You can reduce costs if you do energy efficiency measures and you reduce emissions at the same time. By doing these projects and communicating them to the market, you become more attractive to talent, you know. For some things, if you have a LEED certified building and office building, you get fiscal incentives. You're not paying property taxes, for example. Or if you deal with an issue which is post-consumption waste management and you're doing it alone, you will pay way more than doing it in partnership with other companies who might be co-financing it. You know? Then if you have a really cool sustainable product, you can improve market share or you can enter into new markets which are having higher social and environmental um, baselines than, than the region you're normally working in. So you can either increase market share or conquer new markets. And here comes the ESG thing. You can improve the evaluation or by improving your environmental and social risk management and get cheaper cost of capital because you are assessing funds, ESG funds, um, which giving you um, more favorable conditions. Now, how do we measure? Like, depends, depends. You know, if you want to attract talent, man, talk to talent. What are these people concerned about? And how can you work on that so you're more attractive to them? If you want to enter a new markets, which is the market and what are they concerned about? What are the consumers buying? What are they not buying? 
depends you know if you do it for access to capital markets you know call your bank and say which kind of social environmental indicators do i need to hit in order to get cheaper credit from you guys depends but as leadership did never define like why are we doing why we're doing it and what's the business benefit and most people don't know you get no clear message from leadership and you don't know which indicators to attend to this is why we do everything for everybody but it doesn't make sense at all so that's from the business side of things um so there you need to be clear like if I'm talking to the director of operation, you know, this guy has efficiency targets. So if I can refurbish energy equipment and reduce the energy bill, he will love me. The finance guys will love me. I get promoted. And it's good for the environment at the same time. Now, from the social and environmental impact, you know, like there are a lot of frameworks, ASG guidelines from the banks. There um, are now the accounting guidelines. There is Dow Jones. Uh, there's the um, SASB um, Sustainable Advisory Standards Board um, has industry guidelines for 80 industries um, on what sustainability means um, in that context. But uh, and of course you have the SDGs. Mm -hmm. But. The, the thing we are using, because it's very context specific, normally these questions, we use the theory of change. So we try to drill down and say, like, okay, what's your theory of change? What do you want to achieve? What are the objectives? In order to attain the objectives, which activities need, do you need to do? What are the immediate outputs of these activities? What are the midterm outcomes you know and what are what is the long-term impact and how can we potentially measure that so mm -hmm. um a theory of change is really interesting um because it can detail that um for for whatever you're trying to achieve and it's it's mm -hmm. context sensitive okay yeah. Thanks, Heiko. Um, another question from Anna in the Netherlands. Can you give a few examples of successful collaborations between corporations and NGOs? Let's go with Danon. Um, Lucas Urbano, at the beginning of his career, he was, you know, he was in the hiring process at Danon for um, uh, a technical position when they discovered he was trained in life cycle analysis. And Danone had just assumed uh, assumed the goal to reduce emissions by 20% within the next five years and 20% of the bonus of the senior management team of all around the world depended on achieving that goal. So they needed somebody to fix that. And then Lucas appeared and said, like, I have the technology which might help us. So he did an analysis, life cycle analysis of, of the processes at Danone in Brazil and said, okay, we can relaunch one of our um, children directed product lines, which is called Danonino, with um, combined with the um, the promise that for every Danonino we sell, we're going to protect one square meter of um, the Amazon forest. This was the most successful relaunch of Danonino in the whole history of the product in Brazil. How did the NGO help? They helped in two ways because they first discussed that every Danonino should be saving one tree. But trees in the Amazon can get quite big and that, that the economics didn't work out. So the NGO came up and said, like, why instead of the tree, we don't go by square meters, which drills down costs by 10% uh, to 10%. So they have to make the whole thing viable. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is consumers are very critical. So on the Danonino, there was a hotline. And if you called there, you didn't end up at Danon you ended up at the NGO because they had the trust of society. 
So the angel were responding to the doubts of the consumers to say, like, is this really true? So I can see that NGOs can bring in expertise. They can bring in access to networks you don't have access to. And they have the trust you'll never get because you're a profit-driven organization. And being a profit-driven organization, you're looking for your advantage. Mm. And just following on from, from Anna's question on collaboration, what really is the role of collaboration in, in maximizing social impact? And also, more importantly, what are the factors that actually increase the chances of success? Because it's not easy for a company to, to partner with, the, with another company, let alone with a nonprofit organization. Uh, good questions. Um, I think like there, there are two ways to go about collaboration. And I think the easiest one is like how I got to it is looking at risks. You know, it's like, why is, why is it that Coca-Cola collaborates with Ambev, which are their competitors in, in drinks in Brazil? Um, they collaborate on two issues, which they know, like, you know, it's out of our hands. Like, even if I pull all the money together to resolve that issue, it's not going to go away. One is post-consumption waste. And so like we train waste picker communities in order to pick up sufficient waste per year. So we can tell the authorities in Brazil, like all the, the, the packaging we put in the market, the equivalent of this is recycled by the communities we support. And the other thing is water. Um, Coca-Cola and Ambev realized in Sao Paulo that they are operating in an area which is um, increasingly facing water scarcity. And they made simulations and they said like, okay, what does it cost in order to relocate the, my production facilities to another region which has more water? And how much does it cost in order to incentivize local farmers to reforest, the, reforest their areas? So the, the water, local water production goes up and we can operate here for a longer term of time. Reforestation was the cheaper option and the CEOs got together and said like, okay, let's do this. These are risk-based and these are like, you get an economic case quite quickly for that. Um, now, I think the big barrier is like, how do you get brand-driven companies like these two? They're jumping over their own shadow and say like, okay, let's collaborate on that. Um, because normally they want to print their brand on it and say like, this has been my initiative. But I think this mm -hmm. is, you know, this is changing. Um, and thanks God it's changing. I think the more difficult one is um, where companies get together in order to leverage positive impact. Mm -hmm. um, which is not risk driven. And I think if you look for a community where that might happen more, look at the B Corp movement because they have initiatives where a couple of companies are working together um, uh, on resolving issues and, and creating synergies between what they're doing. Mm. And what are the, some of the bigger challenges with, with, with some of these collaborations? I think you, you have mentioned a few. Uh, the competitive nature and and wanting to kind of get the credit. How how do you establish collaborations where there are really clear differences, especially cultural differences, perhaps between between organizations? I think that's the, you know we're still working on this, but maybe my first hint as a business school professor is providing experiences. You know. Okay. When Brazil instituted the new um, post-consumption waste law, um, the CEO of Natura, um, Alexandre, uh, what was his surname? Alexandre Calucci, um, thought like things were not moving quick enough. So he took his senior leadership team. They went to an open waste dump. He asked them to pull out some of the waste there. Some of the waste was related to Natura. And then he said, society is not accepting this anymore. We need to move forward. 
If you do this in a collaborative setting, because it's not only Natura's waste, it's Coca-Cola's waste, it's all everybody's waste, you might get people on an emotional level to say like, let's step over our brand and other issues and let's do that together. Now, how do you get executives to join you to go to an open waste dump? If you have any ideas to that, let me know. <laughs> okay. I think I'll, I'll have to throw that one out to Arlen. As if anyone has any ideas, please put them in, in the comments section and we can discuss them. We just have a few minutes left, but we're getting some really interesting questions. Um, I hope we can get through most of them. Marjorie in Sweden is asking, based on your experience, what would you say are the similarities and differences in the challenges faced by corporate social entrepreneurs across cultural contexts and countries? I think that's a fascinating question. Well, I think like the nature, how the corporations react to social entrepreneurs is very similar because I think the business mindset is universal in that sense. Um, so I think and that's what I see at the League of Entrepreneurs. You know, one of the one of the things we do sometimes is to do case clinics. You know, I presented to my CFO. He threw me out of the office, never wants to see me again. My project is dead. What do I do? You know, <laughs> and then I just go like, relax. I've been there before. I know, you know, let's like, how about doing this? How about doing that? How about who's, you know, this guy is trusting whom? How can we influence his network around him, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, I think that's one thing. And the other thing where I really think like there's very much potential for the future is to address issues collectively, mm -hmm. climate change, post consumption waste, energy efficiency, how to get education to the poor. You know, these are all issues which are universal in its nature. And if we can get a group of superhero entrepreneurs coming from the private sector, combined with entrepreneurs from the public sector, combined from, with entrepreneurs from the third sector, man, you know, there must be a Nobel Prize somewhere. Right, definitely. Um, another question from Marek in the UK. Knowing what you know now, Heiko, is there anything that you would have done differently in your own journey as an entrepreneur and as somebody who studies and supports entrepreneurship? I'm sure you could write a whole other book on that one. <laughs> you know, Marike, I think there's no, there's no, there's no planning for this. Um, you go your way, you, you, you model yourself through. Um, and you become like, because of the journey, you become more aware of who you are, where your strengths are, and, you know, where you're good at. I like that phrase, like, you know, the purpose of life is to, no, no, the, the, the challenge of life is to find your gift and the purpose is to give it away. Um, I'm currently writing a book on how to become a corporate Jedi, you know, looking at the Star Wars story, which is based on the, the hero's journey, uh, which has been discovered by Joseph Campbell, uh, who wrote a book which is called The Hero of a Thousand Faces, looking at myth, looking at Jesus, Buddha, et cetera, et cetera, and saying like, actually, like all these stories follow the same pattern. Mm -hmm. um, and and he, he designed it as the hero journey, which then has been picked up by George Lucas, who based Star Wars on that. So the book is basically, this is what Campbell said about the stage. This is how you see it at Star Wars. And this is an entrepreneur at that stage. And if you are at that stage, you probably experience that and that and that. And if you want to move to the next stage, I recommend you to A, B, C, D. So this is this is what I'm like really liking to work on right now. If anybody has some connections to editors or to Disney, let me know. Um, but what I want to say with this is enjoy the journey. You know, don't try to accelerate. 
you're moving at the speed which you're moving at and this is just the speed you need mm -hmm. um of course you're never going to find any sustainability professional who's going to say like man we are advancing so quick you know the sustainable development goals this will be easy never you know never it's in the nature of the things it's never enough for us it's never enough but that doesn't mean that you need to be too worried about the speed of things because it's also your development journey and your development needs time you know maybe you need to bump your head into the same issue for five or ten times and then you go like okay and then you become bad at it you know it's just like learning an instrument learning sports you know it's training it's continued training 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 so the more you train the better you get absolutely i think that's a wonderful parting shot heiko i don't know if there's anything else you want to say as we close off the session any last words for our aspiring entrepreneurs well guys i'm, I'm really excited that you are making this course i'm really excited that there are so many of you that you know you know, we have double the participants than last year. So this is cool. I feel that entrepreneurship is an emerging trend. And I'm happy to see that we have um, two companies which are pretty well represented here in the, in the cohort. And I would, you know, encourage you guys get together internally and make some noise, you know, and share your stories. Um, I think this is important to 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 signal to others, you know, there is a way to bring your purpose to to the to, to, to your job and to use your organization. You know, I always feel like Morpheus. And so like you want to take the blue pill and stay a functionary within your organization, fulfilling your job description until the end of your life, or you take the entrepreneurial pill and man, do we have an exciting life for you guys. So take the right pill and then tell us about it. <laughs> and you'll not walk alone. You'll never walk alone. There are thousands of entrepreneurs out there who are happy to support you if you are having a cool idea. Me inclusive. We would have loved to have more time with you, Heiko. And uh, I know you have so much more rich nuggets uh, to share with us, but that's all the time we have for today. But we're really looking forward to your new book. And we just want to thank you so much for making the time to speak with us and, and share what you've shared with us today and for inspiring all of us as well. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And may the force be with you. <laughs> Absolutely. And many thanks to all of you who've been watching this webinar live. I think you've heard so many uh, great takeaways from Heiko. I would encourage you to actually rewatch this, uh, this webinar if you can. And I think there are many, many notes that you can be jotting down. Uh, for me, I think it comes back to where we started when you were saying, Heiko, what if? I think that should be our, our guiding ma mantra going forward because anything's possible. So I hope today's session has helped to give you a much better understanding of social entrepreneurship and the amazing opportunities and benefits that it holds for private corporations. Be sure to make the time to read through and reflect on this week's course material so that you can go deeper into the subject and remember, of course, it's a very safe space for learning and you'll get out of this course what you put in. So let's continue to discuss and engage on the course platform. And of course, feel free to throw in your own personal experiences. We always love to hear about what you are doing. So enjoy the rest of your week and goodbye for now.